Chapter One of Esther Reed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Esther Reed by Pansy. Chapter One Esther's Home. She did not look very much as if she were asleep, nor acted as though she expected to get a chance to be very soon. There was no end to the things which she had to do, for the kitchen was long and wide, and took many steps to set it in order, and it was drawing toward tea-time of a Tuesday evening, and there were fifteen boarders who were, most of them, punctual to a minute. Sadie, the next oldest sister, was still at the academy, as also were Alfred and Julia, while little Minnie, the pet and darling, most certainly was not. She was around in the way, putting little fingers into every possible place where little fingers ought not to be. It was well for her that, no matter how warm and vexed and out of order Esther might be, she never reached the point in which her voice could take other than a loving tone in speaking to Minnie, for Minnie, besides being a precious little blessing in herself, was the child of Esther's oldest sister, whose home was far away in a western graveyard, and the little girl had been with them since her early babyhood three years before. So Esther hurried to and from the pantry with quick, nervous movements, as the sun went toward the west, saying to Maggie, who was ironing with all possible speed, "'Maggie, do hurry, and get ready to help me, or I shall never have tea ready,' saying it in a sharp, fretful tone. Then— no, no, Bertie, don't touch, in quite a different tone to Minnie, who laid loving hands on a box of raisins. I am hurrying as fast as I can, Maggie made answer, but such an ironing as I have every week can't be finished in a minute. Well, well, don't talk. That won't hurry matters any. Sadie Reed opened the door that led from the dining room to the kitchen and peeped in a thoughtless young head covered with bright brown curls. How are you, Esther? And she emerged fully into the great warm kitchen, looking like a bright flower picked from the garden and put out of place. Her pink gingham dress and white ruffled apron, yes, and the very school books which she swung by their strap, waking a smothered sigh in Esther's heart. Oh, my patience, was her greeting. Are you home? Then school is out. I guess it is, said Sadie. We've been down to the river since school. Sadie, won't you come and cut the beef and cake and make the tea? I did not know it was so late, and I'm nearly tired to death. Sadie looked sober. I would in a minute, Esther, only I've brought Florence Bain home with me, and I should not know what to do with her in the meantime. Besides, Mr. Hammond said he would show me about my algebra if I'd go out on the piazza this minute. Well, go then, and tell Mr. Hammond to wait for his tea until he gets it. Esther answered crossly. "'Here, Julia,' to the ten-year-old newcomer, "'go away from that raisin-box this minute. Go upstairs, out of my way. And Alfred, too. Sadie, take Minnie with you. I can't have her here another instant. You can afford to do that much, perhaps.' "'Oh, Esther, you're cross,' said Sadie, in a good-humoured tone, coming forward after the little girl. "'Come, Bertie. Auntie Essie's cross, isn't she?' Come with Aunt Sadie. Let's go to the piazza and make Mr. Hammond tell us a story. And Minnie, Esther's darling, who never received other than loving words from her, went gleefully off, leaving another heartburn to the weary girl. They stung her, those words. Auntie Essie's cross, isn't she? Back and forth, from dining room to pantry, from pantry to dining room, went the quick feet. At last she spoke. "'Maggie, leave the ironing and help me. It is time tea was ready.' "'I'm just ironing Mr. Holland's shirt,' objected Maggie. "'Well, I don't care if Mr. Holland never has another shirt ironed. I want you to go to the spring for water and fill the table pitchers, and do a dozen other things.' The hall clock in the dining room struck five, and the dining bell pealed out its prompt summons through the house. The family gathered promptly and noisily, schoolgirls, half a dozen or more, Mr. Hammond, the principal of the academy, Miss Moulton, the preceptress, Mrs. Brookley, the music teacher, 
and Dr. Van Anden, the new physician, Mr. and Mrs. Holland, and Mr. Arnett, Mr. Holland's clerk. There was a moment's hush while Mr. Hammond asked a blessing on the food. Then the merry talk went on. For them all, Maggie poured cups of tea, and Esther passed bread and butter, and beef and cheese, and Sadie gave overflowing dishes of blackberries, and chattered like a magpie, which last she did everywhere and always. This has been one of the scorching days, Mr. Holland said. It was as much as I could do to keep cool in the store, and we generally are well off for a breeze there. It was more than I could do to keep cool anywhere, Mrs. Holland answered. I gave it up long ago in despair. Esther's lip curled a little. Mrs. Holland had nothing in the world to do from morning until night but to keep herself cool. She wondered what the lady would have said to the glowing kitchen, where she had passed most of the day. "'Miss Esther looks as though the heat had been too much for her cheeks,' Mrs. Brookley said, laughing. "'What have you been doing?' "'Something besides keeping cool,' Esther answered soberly. "'Which is a difficult thing to do, however,' Dr. Van Anden said, speaking soberly, too. "'I don't know, sir. If I had nothing to do but that, I think I could manage it.' "'I have found trouble sometimes in keeping myself at the right temperature, even in January.' Esther's cheeks glowed yet more. She understood Dr. Van Anden, and she knew her face did not look very self-controlled. No one knows what prompted Minnie to speak just then. "'Aunt Sadie said Auntie Essie was cross. Were you, Auntie Essie?' The household laughed, and Sadie came to the rescue. "'Why, Minnie, you must not tell what Aunt Sadie says. It was just as sure to be nonsense as it is that you are a chatterbox.' Esther thought that they would never all finish their supper and depart, but the latest comer strolled away at last, and she hurried to toast a slice of bread, make a fresh cup of tea, and send Julia after Mrs. Reed. Sadie hovered around the pale, sad-faced woman while she ate. "'Are you truly better, mother? I've been worried half to pieces about you all day.' "'Oh, yes, I'm better. Esther, you look dreadfully tired. Have you much more to do?' only to trim the lamps and make three beds that I had not time for this morning and get things ready for breakfast and finish Sadie's dress. Can't Maggie do any of these things? Maggie is ironing. Mrs. Reed sighed. It's a good thing that I don't have the sick headache very often, she said sadly, or you would soon wear yourself out. Sadie, are you going to the Lyceum tonight? "'Yes, ma'am. Your worthy daughter has the honor of being editress, you know, tonight. "'Esther, can't you go down? Never mind that dress. Let it go to Guinea.' "'You wouldn't think so by tomorrow evening,' Esther said shortly. "'No, I can't go.' The work was all done at last, and Esther betook herself to her room. How tired she was! Every nerve seemed to quiver with weariness. It was a pleasant little room, this one which she entered with its low windows looking out toward the river, and its cozy furniture all neatly arranged by Sadie's tasteful fingers. Esther seated herself by the open window and looked down on the group who lingered on the piazza below, looked down on them with her eyes and with her heart, yet envied while she looked, envied their free and easy life without a care to harass them, so she thought, envied Sadie her daily attendance at the academy, a matter which she so early in life had been obliged to have done with, envied Mrs. Holland the very ribbons and laces which fluttered in the evening air. It had grown cooler now, a strong breeze blew up from the river and freshened the air, and, as they sat below there enjoying it, the sound of their gay voices came up to her. "'What do they know about heat or care or trouble?' she said scornfully, thinking over all the weight of her eighteen years of life. She hated it, this life of hers, just hated it. The sweeping, dusting, making beds, trimming lamps, working from morning till night. No time for reading or study or pleasure. Sadie had said she was cross, and Sadie had told the truth. She was cross most of the time, fretted with her everyday petty cares and fatigues. Oh, she said over and over, if something would only happen, if I could have one day, just one day, different from the others. 
but no it's the same old thing sweep and dust and clear up and eat and sleep i hate it all yet had esther nothing for which to be thankful that the group on the piazza had not if she had but thought she had a robe and a crown and a harp and a place waiting for her up before the throne of god and all they had not esther did not think of this so much asleep was she that she did not even know that none of those gay hearts down there below her had been given up to christ not one of them for the academy teachers and dr van anden were not among them oh esther was asleep she went to church on the sabbath and to preparatory lecture on a weekday she read a few verses of her bible frequently not every day she knelt at her bedside every night and said a few words of prayer and this was all she lay at night side by side with a young sister who had no claim to a home in heaven and never spoke to her of jesus she worked daily side by side with a mother who through many trials and discouragement was living a christian life and never talked with her of their future rest she met daily sometimes almost hourly a large household and never so much as thought of asking them if they too were going some day home to god she helped her young brother and sister with their geography lessons and never mentioned to them the heavenly country whither they themselves might journey she took the darling of the family often in her arms and told her stories of bo peep and babes in the wood and robin redbreast and never one of jesus and his call to the tender lambs this was esther and this was esther's home end of chapter 1 recording by trisha g